Thank you. And uh, Hello everyone! Welcome to episode 2 of our pop culture series. I'm Sukuya Mio and I'm here live from New York with the Japan Foundation's arts and culture team. In this monthly series, we'll be discussing various topics from anime, manga, video games, kawaii culture, and more from academic and professional perspectives. For the second session, we will discuss two animes. Ghost in a Shell and a Neon Genesis Evangelion as an introduction of anime studies. The original movie of Ghost in the Shell and a TV series of Evangelion were released during the same year in 1995, which was 25 years ago. Since then, these two works have been considered to be the massive monuments in the anime canon, both emerging as cyberpunk epics in the mid-90s each addressing issues of identity and potential for technological interventions. However, they both managed to do so in different ways and with differently composed subject. Today's discussion will address both of these interesting similarities, but more compellingly, the particular differences in which each director tackles this cyberpunk discourse. Today, we have invited two guest speakers and a moderator. Our first speaker is Dr. Susan Napier from Tufts University in Massachusetts. She is considered one of the leading authorities on Japanese animation in the world, who published the first academic book on anime in the West, titled Anime from Akira's to Princess Mononoke, experiencing contemporary Japanese animation about 20 years ago. This is an updated edition covering from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle and a great introduction to anime for anyone eager to understand it. Also, her latest book, Miyazaki World, examines the 12 films that Miyazaki Hayao, the director of Studio Ghibli, directed and contains her interviews with Miyazaki himself. Today, she will give us a presentation about Ghost in a Shell. Our second speaker is Dr. Stevie Swan from Hosei University in Japan. 
He has studied and researched a wide variety of topics relating to the arts and the media, ranging from traditional theatrical performance to contemporary media. Recently, he has been working on academic articles about Evangelion for the upcoming book, Anime Studies, Media-Specific Approaches to Neon Genesis Evangelion, which will be available early next year. He will give us a presentation about Evangelion today, and I'm very excited that he will share some of his recent ideas on the series. And our moderator is Dr. Frenchy Lanning from Minneapolis College of Arts and Design. She was the editor-in-chief of Macademia, a completed 10-volume book series, which is the first and only academic journal dedicated to anime and manga in English. And she is now co-editor-in-chief of the new Macademia, second arc journal. Through the journal, she knows today's speaker as her friends as well as her colleagues. So, for more information about our guest speakers, please check their official websites from the links we put in the description box below. Today, we will begin our program by listening to each presentation from our guest speakers. After their presentations, our guests will discuss about two titles together. After their discussion, they will answer your questions in a Q&A session. So please feel free to comment or ask questions in a live chat. Although we only received a lot of questions in advance, we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible. Also, this is a quick reminder to please um, keep the live chat on YouTube clean and friendly. So uh, now let's move on to the presentations. I will return later for the Q&A session. See you later. Uh, Thank you, and um, welcome to this presentation on Ghost in the Shell. I'm very happy to be doing this. In fact, I feel very lucky to have the chance to, to introduce you to this really extraordinary film. Um, it's extraordinary in many ways, and we'll go into why Ghost in the Shell is so, so, such a great work of art. But I also want to mention that it's an important film, and it's important also in a number of ways. Uh, one way it's very important is that it has had a surprising impact on Hollywood live action cinema. Uh, it's well known now and the Wachowski directors have acknowledged uh, how influential Ghost in the Shell was on their major groundbreaking science fiction series, the Matrix Trilogy. Uh, also recently in 2017, we've had another Hollywood moment where uh, a live action Hollywood cinema presentation of Ghost in the, in the Shell was created starring Scarlett Johansson. And that's about all I'm gonna say about the live action film. Uh, but uh, there are other things that are even more interesting about Ghost in the Shell, and that is what an important film it is in terms of anime history. Because Ghost in the Shell was the first Japanese anime film to reach the top of the billboard charts in America. Uh, and that is kind of historic because it represents a number of things. First, it means that it was popular, that it was becoming, that anime, this particular anime film was becoming known outside of the niche audiences that initially had been niched in anime before. And not only was it becoming popular, but its popularity at number one in the charts meant they would also make money. And money is important. It means that people will want to uh, create more anime, that they, they'll become more of a buzz around it. And ultimately, uh, the DVD sales and the video sales of Ghost in the Shell uh, after that moment, 1995, have accumulated to, I believe, last statistic I read was $40 million. So this is a film, that, an anime film that has had clout. But even more importantly was what this film was. This is unfortunate, even now, we still there, have to deal with the perception if you love animation, uh, but especially in 1995, there was this perception that anime and animation were trivial, vulgar, um, child-oriented, silly uh, works that were simply not worth taking seriously. And Ghost in the Shell really changed that perception. Here was a non-Western, 
Japanese product, uh, animated product, that I think could be described in two ways. Uh, on one hand, you could say it's an action-oriented, action-packed, violent, beautifully created thriller uh, in a science fiction genre, which has interludes of lyrical melancholy in it. Or the other way you could describe it is it's a film that is lyrical and philosophical and asks big questions about who we are, uh, what is our identity, how do we find our identity in a lonely world of modernity, of technology, of consumerism, and that at the same time has extraordinary sequences of action and science fiction, a kind of breathtaking science fiction uh, works of, of incredible beauty uh, inside it as well. So this is Ghost in the Shell, uh, a movie that is um, really tackles the big questions, the question of, of identity and the quest for identity uh, symbolized by uh, the big issue that uh, the protagonist of the film, Motoko Kusanagi, uh, has to deal with. She's a cyborg, but does she have a soul? And in the film that scene is a ghost. Uh, and how, does, how is that soul expressed? Is it something that is just inherent, that's ineffable, or is it something that has to be created through the body, uh, the shell, the husk that kind of encloses all of us? And we see this right from the beginning in the tour de force opening scene. Uh, when I call this opening scene a tour de force, I mean that it's powerful, propulsive, uh, beautifully staged, it brings you in immediately. And in this opening scene, we see Kusanagi uh, standing alone uh, in a top of a gigantic building, looking down at an immense urban thoroughfare. And she's alone, which is very important. We, we see her dealing with loneliness throughout the movie. Uh, and she's also about to take action. She's about to jump off the building and engage in an assassination uh, project. And this is a world in which you have corrupt uh, politicians, corrupt governments, uh, business controlling everything. And the net has become this enormous, gigantic, tentacular, uh, kind of in, uh, amorphous institute that, institution that everyone is part of, including Motoko. And we see her falling and it's quite an impressive scene. Uh, it's a bit scary. Her body, it seems to be naked. She's actually wearing thermal optic camouflage, but she's, she seems vulnerable and she's falling. And what is she falling into? And I think this is interesting because Oshi, the director of this film, was at one point very uh, attended seminary and thought about becoming a Christian priest. And so I can't help thinking that the notion of the fall is perhaps related to a biblical fall, a fall from uh, kind of a higher point into a world of in, in Motoko, in Kusanagi's case, corruption, uh, danger, um, uncertainty, uh, consumerism, in other words, into reality, and she is falling. Uh, we then see a very, very exciting this assassination scene, really uh, intense, vivid, violent scene. And then uh, Oshi, the director, completely changes direction again. And we see what I call a birth scene, which is one of the, another kind of tour de force scene in this film. It's, uh, we see how the Kusanagi is constructed because she is constructed, she is a cyborg. And it starts first with an array of data on the screen. And then we see this clearly mechanical uh, machine-like creation being, being made. Um, and then that becomes a little bit more the camera in a sense draws back and we see that this machine-like creation is also being imbued with humanoid um, aspects. We see sinews and muscles, we see essentially a skeleton. Uh, and then we see uh, a final, uh, almost final birth scene in which she is seen as a humanoid character, as a, a certainly looking human, if, uh, if still somehow kind of eerie and other as well. And then the final scene, we have Kusanagi just coming up out of what almost could be amniotic fluid or just a, a bath or something, looking like a, essentially a, a conventional human woman. So we see all this in a very uh, kind of mind-bending sequence. It's not like anything anyone had ever done before. The Wachowskis apparently were very impressed by it. And um, it, the sequence itself 
uh, and the whole movie, in fact, makes me think of a, um, uh, a quotation from Jane Batkin, who writes on identity and animation. And she says, identity politics shape and are shaped by animation in a compelling manner. Self, difference, the body, gender, place, and culture are embraced, contested, assimilated, and dissected as animation moves and evolves, constantly reshaping and reimagining itself. And this is a general uh, comment by Batkin, but it really works so well to kind of discuss the whole narrative development of Ghost in the Shell as Kusanagi uh, discovers, tries to discover who she is, uh, and we see her being assimilated, dissected, and also how she moves, evolves, and constantly reshapes and reimagines herself. So where does all this amazing stuff come from? Um, how did Ghost in the Shell uh, appear uh, in 1995? Well, um, of course, part of it is from animation itself. Animation is a medium, not a genre. And I argue that it's a medium that particularly tends towards the creative, the dreamlike, the fantastic, the science fictional, because you can do anything you like with animation. There's a freedom and a liberation that tends to, I think, uh, provo provoke you, the, if you're a director or an animator, into really interesting mind-bending scenarios and uh, the attendant beautiful mind-bending imagery that comes with it. But specifically, of course, this um, movie came from the mind of uh, the director Mamoru Oshii, whom I call an auteur. Auteur is a director who has a special kind of stamp in his movies that you can see as he goes along certain preoccupations, certain images, uh, certain he'll use the same composer. Uh, in the case of, of Oshii, he often has movies that are um, have strong young women protagonists that have a very dreamlike quality to them and that engage with profound philosophical questions about our place in the modern world and loneliness in that modern world, but also have amazingly cool uh, technological mecha, what we call mecha scenes uh, involved in very advanced and uh, extraordinarily well realized and detailed uh, kind of uh, futuristic machinery. So uh, one film I might just mention is his, his earliest um, and most uh, uh, kind of most artsy film. It's called Angel's Egg. Uh, and you'll see even in the little uh, still I have, you have this strange dreamlike landscape. Uh, there is a young woman in it. She is actually uh, holding, carrying an egg around on this kind of dreamlike, almost nightmare world. Uh, again, you, I wonder about the Christian elements here. They're, again, even calling it an angel, Tenshi, and she eventually meets a young man in a soldier's costume who's carrying a cross. Uh, we never really know what this all means, but it's a gorgeous work of art kind of film. Um, oh, she then, as time went on, became more kind of into action and more straightforward plotting. His two most famous movies, aside from Ghost in the Shell, are probably the Pat labor ones. Uh, they are again in the kind of near future uh, in a world where you have these strange, magnificent technological creations and these pat labors uh, and a, a very interesting kind of smart woman police officer and a very interesting police force uh, and great special effects. I mentioned Pat Labor 2, the most recent movie, uh, because it also has another preoccupation of, of Oshis, which is of, uh, it involves a terrorist plot uh, uh, concocted by a very strange, uh, eerie creature who is very, very intense um, and ideologically uh, powerful and strangely alluring. And I think there is a little bit of this, this creation in the puppet master uh, of, um, of Ghost in the Shell as well, something that is out there that we are fascinated by, a little bit scared of. Uh, other aspects of Ghost in the Shell that should be mentioned are where it belongs in a larger kind of cinematic and literary uh, genre, and that is cyberpunk. And cyberpunk, as the name suggests, is um, said in the near future, where again, sort of cybernetic, cyber, um, the whole internet has become a uh, kind of 
sunk into our way of life. This, this seems obvious now, but when cyberpunk first came out, the first major novel was Neuromancer. This was seen like, wow, cool fiction. Uh, but it is uh, a world of te technology where technology rules, but also the punk aspect of it is suggested it's a gritty kind of dark world. It's not the conventional wonderful future of flying cars and beautiful crystalline cities that if you'd been um, reading science fiction in the 1960s and early 70s, you might've imagined. And uh, perhaps the epitome of the new bad, what I call the new bad future uh, movies or fiction is a movie called Blade Runner uh, from 1984, uh, which is gritty, dark, uh, profound, and also um, shows a dehumanization of, of human beings in this highly technological corporatized world. And in fact, if anything, the only creations in Blade Runner in this new bad future that seem to have any humanity are these creatures called replicants who are not quite cyborgs, but in a way quite similar to uh, the cyborg creation that is Kusanagi. And I actually had the chance to meet Oshi uh, many years ago, and I asked him very, very shyly, uh, did he uh, think of Blade Runner as having an influence on Ghost in the Shell? And he looked at me and he said, Mochiron, which means, of course, or obviously. So there you are. Uh, what is the new bad future specifically? visions of the future as oppressive, ecologically despoiled, dangerous places within which there seems no security beyond friendship and loyalty, and even those are never entirely certain. So we're back to the theme of loneliness again, because Kusanagi does have colleagues, she has a place, she has a profession, and yet there is an inherent loneliness that comes across very, very early on uh, in this amazing scene that takes place right after the assassination scene where we see her waking up uh, framed against a high, uh, kind of a high tech um, skyscraper, uh, urban cityscape. Uh, and she is, she looks profoundly alone uh, in this great big dehumanized uh, alienating kind of world. Uh, and I should mention that although I think this is very uh, apropos for Ghost in the Shell, this vision, the vision of a woman alone uh, against a, sort of a modern world is something that we've seen before back in 19, 1950s with uh, this picture by Edward Hopper. Um, it's uh, so, so called Morning Sunshine. And you see again a woman alone, uh, shadows, the sense of her kind of looking out at something uh, looks industrial, perhaps it's a mill, perhaps it's a factory, but again, the, the sense of a kind of inherent loneliness. And of course, the loneliness of modernity is something that didn't just occur in 1995. It's been around for at least 100 years. Hopper was undoubtedly kind of playing with this vision. And I have to include one more vision, which I thought was kind of interesting. I won't talk about, as I say, the Scarlett Johansson movie in which uh, the, we have Ghost in the Shell redone, but there is a movie earlier called Lost in Translation, which Scarlett Johansson starred, uh, set in Tokyo. And here again, we have this vision of a woman alone against this this um, huge, enormous uh, urban landscape, that worldscape even, that, that seems inherently alien, alienating. And she's looking out and sort of wondering what her place is, where her place is, where does she belong? And this is true, I would say, of uh, all these characters. Um, just a few other moments when we see um, Kusanagi on her quest, because this is in a way a quest movie. She is trying to find out where she belongs. And one way she does is that she goes diving in Tokyo Harbor, which is very dangerous because she's a cyborg and she's really heavy, but she doesn't mind that. She feels in the darkness and the water, some kind of sense of, of perhaps um, commingling with herself, figuring out who she is, even some hope. And we see her as she rises to the surface. As I say, we often we have scenes of her falling, of her diving in, and then she's she's coming up. And what is she seeing? Is it herself? Is it doppelganger? Is it her future? And after she rises from the surface, there's a scene in which she quotes from Corinthians in the Bible. Uh, For now, we see it through a glass darkly, but soon we shall see face to face. And we do see, and this is a kind of big moment in the movie. She starts to, in fact. Uh, in the last part of the movie, she does find another another face to which she um, 
becomes uh, connected with. And this is, I won't go into this, the final moments of the movie, but they're quite extraordinary. And she does come become connected with another art, artificial creation uh, known as the puppet master. And one of her questions is, should she go in with the puppet master or not? Uh, and again, we have a sense of her vulnerable loneliness, but here is something else in there that someone else that might, might, she might share her identity with and ease her loneliness. And so uh, I won't, um, as I say, tell you any more except to say this is a quest movie. And one of the most beautiful scenes in it is of Kusanagi going on a boat ride on a canal through an incredibly gritty, dark, but weirdly beautiful, eerily beautiful urban landscape. And as she goes along the boat ride, uh, she's not, this time she's not looking down, she's not falling, she's looking up. And what is she looking up for? Well, she sees things. She sees a woman who looks just like her in a department store window. She sees a basset hound, a little symbol of something, another non-human creature. And then she sees mannequins. And she also kind of looks up at the sky as if, is she looking for some kind of ineffable something to, that she can bond with? And um, it, you can say, this is quite a long, long, uh, piece here. And you could say, is it necessary? It's not part of the action. It doesn't necessarily move the narrative along. But of course, most people who see the film think it's extremely necessary and think it's one of the most beautiful scenes ever created in anything, not just an anime, not just a science fiction film, but any any film. It's, it's quite beautiful. So the lyrics to this that accompany the sequence talk about something called amakudarite, coming down from heaven, as if a heavenly being, being is coming down uh, into the rainy, gritty, dark world of humanity. Uh, and that's the, really the question that Motoko, the Kusanagi, uh, leaves us with. Uh, should we still be part of this, this human world, keep on our shells, or do we want to look for something different up in the sky, up out there that's in a different form of consciousness? So you'll have to see the film to see what she decides. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Stevie Swan. I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Global and Interdisciplinary Studies at Hosei University in Tokyo. Before I begin, I'd like to thank Sakuya Mio for organizing this event and the Japan Foundation New York for hosting it and inviting me. I'm very grateful to be here and contribute to this program. And as part of this episode, my presentation will be on Evangelion, specifically on revisiting and analyzing its infamous endings. Before I begin, I thought I should provide some alerts. Firstly, I thought I'd warn you that I will be providing spoilers, although the anime is 25 years old now, and I'm guessing most of you watching are familiar with the work. I'd also like to note that this is not some final explanation of the larger story, giving you a definitive answer or interpretation of the ending. Moreover, this reading will probably seem a bit conceptual, but Eva itself is a conceptual anime, so I think the approach fits. Lastly, this presentation is based on the chapter I contributed to the book Anime Studies, Media-Specific Approaches to Neon Genesis Evangelion, which will be available early next year. So I urge you to explore that volume for more on this topic, as I won't be able to cover everything in this presentation. In any case, the first finale that I will be addressing is the TV series ending in episodes 25 and 26, which foregoes the external narrative of the angel attacks and nerve, and instead goes inside the characters' minds in a journey of self-discovery. The second finale is the filmic ending, End of Evangelion, which is seen as an alternative to the TV episodes, presenting the finale of the external world of angels and nerve. The anime's general narrative thrust towards interiority is often read as an evocation of hikikomori, as pulling into oneself to escape the troubled world. But today I would like to provide an alternative interpretation, one which re-examines and focuses on the exploration of selfhood that is a central theme of the series. Indeed, the act of pulling into oneself can be used to pursue the question of who am I, which gets constantly raised throughout the anime. This seems to come to a climax in the final episodes, which uses the animation medium in such a manner that it seems to further ask the question of how am I constituted as a self? To better address these questions, I'd like to look to ideas of performance. 
This is because acting as a character presupposes a type of performance of the self. For someone to act as someone else, we have to presume there is a type of self that the actor can act as and consider the means by which to present that type of self. But this does not mean that all acting is done the same way. Different types of acting can also mean there may be different presumptions or potentials about a different sense of self that can be enacted. Similarly, animation can also be seen as a type of performance that better helps us think through these dynamics. This is because animation directly visualizes for us the creation of different types of selves. Animation can show us non-human actors, everything from animal characters to robots and active objects. As Ursula Hazen notes, instead of a worldview that is limited to human subjects as the only agential actors, in animation, non-human objects can be active, have agency, and have selfhood, allowing us to inquire into their objecthood. And just like the different ways of performing the self by humans on stage and in film, there are different ways of performing animation. And each can show us different types of selfhood of the active objects, human or non-human, through how they are performed in animation. Today, I will be talking about two interrelated modes of animation performance, building on and deviating from the work of animation scholar Donald Crafton. One, embodied acting slash performance, and two, figurative acting slash performance, beginning by explaining the types of selfhood constituted by the extremes of these types of performances. I'll begin with embodied performance. For Crafton, embodied acting is introverted. It is the philosophy and practice of creating imaginatively realized beings with individuality, depth, and internal complexity. Here, bodily motion and gestures are ways to express personality. This is commonly seen in the acting done in Hollywood film and realistic theater based off of the Stanislavskian method acting. Here I raise Johnny Depp's Captain Jack Sparrow because part of his personality and recognizability comes from how distinctly he moves compared to all the other actors in the film. In animation, this is often associated with Disney animation, taking advantage of the lush, smooth movements enabled by full animation. According to Crafton, Disney animators, in fact, developed embodied performance in animation, with many actors taking acting classes and observing actors. Here, animators perform movement to perform emotion. As a consequence, each character's movement is unique to their personality and their individually expressed internal state that appears to arise from within them, as in these scenes from Zootopia, where each character moves at distinctive speeds with unique gestures and facial expressions. In this sense, there is also a distinctive inside-outside border maintained by the character's body, which is entirely specific to them. In effect, their actions appear as if there is some interiority to their character that is then externalized through their individual movements. As such, the characters constituted by the embodied extreme comes close to the selfhood of modern human individualism, even if the active object is not human embodying something like a person who is autonomous and distinct from the external world. Animation, like Beauty and the Beast, narrativizes this, where the only active objects with selfhood in the film are those that used to be humans. One example of something similar in Evangelion is in episode 19, when Eva 01 goes berserk. Here, the Eva unit operates without power, is shown as violent, uncontrollable, bestial, primal, all expressed entirely through the movement in the sequence by key animator Iso Mitsuo. The effect is that Eva 01 appears as internally motivated, like a primordial human, but an agential, active, autonomous object, all displayed through the performance of the animation. To move on to figurative acting, this is, according to Crafton, extroverted. Characters behave as recognizable types, marshalling a small range of instantly identifiable facial and bodily expressions. Beyond unique expressions of interiority isolated to one individual, in figurative acting, characters convey thought and emotion through conventional distortions of their bodies, such as the often utilized arched eyes for smiling, shown here performed by multiple characters. This does not mean characters are somehow lacking emotion. It is just expressed differently, using conventionalized forms and repeated codes and gestures. Prevalent in anime, this type of performance meshes well with limited animation, as in these sequences from episodes 7 and 8, with characters rapidly suddenly shifting between codified expressions. This allows for repeated switching between easily learned codes from a shared repertoire or database. 
Here, each code itself becomes a kind of object that is referenced from other performances to ensure a certain degree of similarity and legibility. In the process, each performance of that code is linked to other iterations of that code. Subsequently, characters become an infectious composite of acquired detail, more like a collection of Pote's traits than a complex expression of inner drives and motives. In other words, characters express their personality and particularity through their specific combination of various codes. Such codes may be thought of coming from other enactments from other characters as iterated on the surface rather than from in the depths of the characters. As such, for figurative actors as selfhood, the character is constituted as a composite of codes with each in turn becoming the source for other codes. Ray is a great example of this in Eva with her solemn expression that repeats throughout the series. Oddly, her lack of expression becomes her signature expression, constituting part of her personality. Much of this takes advantage of the long holds of limited animation where she is caught in stillness. Interestingly, she is also a clone slash copy herself and even sees herself as an object despite her human-like form. Although she is often seen as a vessel, she doesn't simply follow orders, but regularly acts in accordance to her own volition, as when she sacrifices herself in episode 19. Furthermore, just as figurative acting characters are a composite of codes from other characters, Ray sees herself in a similar manner, explaining this in her monologue in episode 14, where she feels the presence of others inside of her before displaying the various other characters from the show, a sequence which can be read as codes from other people inside of her. As the example of Ray directly displays, characters constituted by figurative acting have inside-outside borders that operate in ways that defy the individualism of embodied acting, blurring inside and out from that perspective. Now, up until this point, I've discussed the extremes of these types of acting, but I want to emphasize that figurative acting is not the opposite of embodied acting. They are different modes, each always performed in degrees. In fact, in embodied acting, there is always some relation to codes to be understandable. Otherwise, it results in overly abstract movements that are difficult, if impossible, to understand. So individual, they are completely isolated. And no figurative code can be performed exactly the same, often enacted with slight tinges of distinction. These mutually involved dynamics of embodied and figurative acting and performing selfhood are brought into focus in the TV ending. In episode 26's Pulling Into the Self, in Shinji's monologue of self-discovery in his mind, there is a moment of movement through individualism. In these visuals, a fractal image of a human body goes deeper and deeper, only to appear to rise back to the surface. This morphs into an image of Shinji's face in an abstract, extreme enactment of embodied performance of animation, resulting in an expression of isolation reflected in his exclamation that all the world would just be me. After some further deliberation and help from the voices of other characters, Shinji asserts his understanding of how he is himself shaped by others, moving from individualism towards a more interrelated sense of selfhood. Directly after this revelation, Shinji wakes up in an alternate world of daily life, where he encounters a very different version of Rei. This Rei also utilizes conventionalized codes, such as the toast in the mouth running late to show her tardiness and recklessness. During her introduction to the class, she also utilizes the arched eyes for a cheery smile. These are a stark departure from her somber expressions from the rest of the series and a puzzling shift in character, inv evincing the potential for radical change that the rapid, sudden shifts of figurative acting and limited animation can achieve. At the same time, there are also remnants of individualism that come to the foreground, as such a drastic, abrupt change may appear like a violation of her earlier character if she is considered a modern individual with an interior core personality. After these sequences, Shinji comes to his final revelation of the potential for multiple different me's and breaks through a glass barrier to reveal himself surrounded by the rest of the cast over a pristine coral reef. Here we are supposedly inside Shinji's mind, but the other characters are there, somehow both inside and outside of him. In this sense, the final sequences land closer to the operations of figurative acting, embracing a sense of interrelated selfhood where Shinji is, like Rei, something like an active object made of other objects, where the classically conceived borders of inside and outside of individualism do not operate quite the same way. 
I would also like to note the extremely optimistic tone of these sequences, with the congratulations passed around and the final image of the series depicting Shinji performing the code of arched eyes smiling. So what are the implications of the TV ending leaning heavily towards the tendencies of the extreme of figurative acting? To consider this, I'd like to turn to ecological philosopher Timothy Morton. For Morton, the modern, human-focused autonomous individualism I described earlier maintains a strict sense of inside me and outside environment, which carries with it disastrous ecological consequences. As the human individual subject is seen as in control of non-active objects, the pollution or climate change cannot actually affect me. It is simply an object that cannot act. Moreover, it is easy to simply imagine an away place to put the garbage and global warming. However, it is not individualism that episode 26 ends with, but rather a different sense of selfhood, which resembles the operations of the more ecological mode of existence that Morton proposes. Instead of individual human subjects controlling non-human objects, for Morton, humans and non-humans both exist as active objects, entities that contain a potentially infinite regress of other entities. Here, inside and outside are thoroughly blurred because I am both inside the environment and the environment is inside me. This means that the pollution isn't out there, it's in the air I breathe in my lungs. It is me, in some sense, just as the biosphere is what I depend on to exist. Now, global warming can affect me, as it too is an active object, deeply affecting myself and my life. Such an ecological reading may seem out of step for Eva, but ecological concerns are actually an important motif throughout the series, with various comments on the climate change that occurred after the second impact, the reason why there are the iconic cicadas, a sign of summer, constantly ringing all year round. Furthermore, we can also consider the historical context of certain concurrent events, as it was around the same time the Kyoto Protocol was signed, which extends the 1992 UN framework from the Convention on Climate Change. In addition, there are other blatantly ecologically focused anime around that time, including the smash hit Princess Mononoke in 1997. 1997 is also the year the final film, End of Eva, was released, which reveals a startlingly different view of the ecological stakes of performing selfhood. The optimistic TV ending went through the extreme isolation of individualism in abstract embodied acting, leading towards the tendencies of figurative acting and its operations of interrelated selfhood. In contrast, the filmic ending is far more pessimistic, moving away from the figurative acting tendencies towards inter interrelated objects to the individualism in the extreme of embodied performance, displaying the ecological destruction of this type of selfhood. For instance, compare the performance of embodied acting of Eva 01 in episode 19 noted above to the embodied acting in this scene of Eva 02 in the film. In this sequence, helmed by key animators Iso Mitsuo and Yo Yoshinari, the weighty movements and struggles are foregrounded as Eva 02 viciously destroys the mass production Evas in a messy, violent dance to the death. But here, it is not an object acting on its own, but rather a human, Asuka, asserting her mastery and control over the Eva unit object. As distinct from episode 26, instead of the helpful guidance of others in Shinji's mind, the horror of the idea, from an individualistic point of view, of having others inside of you is highlighted. Rapid images of the other cast members flash across the screen at dizzying speeds. And when the situation appears stable, Asuka berates Shinji, who himself reacts violently, strangling her inside of his mind. Additionally, in contrast to episode 26, which took place entirely in Shinji's mind, the end of Eva film shows up a distinction between in Shinji's mind and the outside world's events, emphasizing an inside-outside divide. Moreover, Shinji's individual decisions inside his mind are precisely what are shown to decide the fate of the external world. Ultimately, Shinji engages in conversations with Dei and Kaoru while floating in a mass of merged humans, which leads to his decision to rebuild or reinstate the barriers between people. He chooses to maintain the inside-outside divide to maintain individualism. Now, this sequence initially seems somewhat positive until he floats to the surface and he is left on a dead earth where humanity has caused the end of life on a planetary scale. The film thus takes the logic of the individual, fully responsible for their actions on the world to its logical extreme and yet completely undercuts it. On the one hand, it is an individual's decision that leads to a massive global event. Just one person can change the world. 
On the other hand, Shinji's decision does little to change the actual outcome, as he is alone with only Asuka at the end of the world. While we may feel that Shinji made the right choice in selecting individualism, supposedly averting global disaster, the world has still ended, even though Shinji did not necessarily start it, with Gendo and Dorzede as the actual catalyst. As such, despite its emphasis on a single individual's choice, the film is ambivalent in regards to an individual's agency in its finale. Individuals' decisions are both ineffective and grandiose on a global scale. As Morton asserts, this is the strange problematic we humans must contend with in the age of global warming, where individual output of pollution is in some ways statistically meaningless, but also clearly a part of the massive ecological catastrophe underway. This is the harrowing ecological vision Endeviva provides, leaving us on a dead earth, but exposing the desolate nature of human environmental destruction, not showing the strange fantasy of last man narratives surviving in a world after the fall of humanity, but depicting the catastrophe, the ends of the world, and directly tying it to the operations and agential assumptions of the performance of individualism. Thank you. We're gonna get a countdown? No. <laughs> Hi, I'm Frenchie Lunning. Am I on now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Frenchie Lunning, your host for tonight's episode. First, we would like to thank the Japan Foundation of New York, who have been financially helping scholars in Japanese studies for many years, and who are the generous producers of this series. The difference they have made for academic opportunities in Japanese studies is exceptional and is greatly appreciated. Tonight's investigation is of two, uh, two key works from the anime canon, Ghost in the Shell and Neon Genesis Evangelion. We will use three short series of questions. The first four questions were developed by Sakua Mio, Susan Napier, Stevie Swan, and I. The second set is a selection taken from the questions submitted on the registration form. Sometimes several related questions have been combined into one. And the final set will be curated from the chat function on Zoom that is at your disposal. As the preceding questions are being discussed, you can post questions that you have and Sakua and her colleagues will curate those questions. Now for the first set. Tsugata Nobuyoki is quoted as saying that both Ghost in the Shell and Evangelion represent a sudden expansion in anime of the mid 1990s. Do you agree? And why is it that these two anime, even after 25 years, still resonate so profoundly through the global communities? Go ahead. Stevie? Uh, no, no, Susan, please. Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, I think um, in a way, what we've been talking about in our um, discussion sort of shows why they're, they're still so resonant, because they are still about questions that people really care about. But I would also say particularly in, um, I, I think what one thing has happened in the last few years is that technology and discussions of technology and the way technology can be used or abused or enfold us or immerse us have become so much more just part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's very, uh, you know, become even more extreme. I mean, you know, 1995, I was thinking when I, um, I, saw uh, just the other night uh, Ghost in the Shell again, I thought, God, they were really prescient. They really knew what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. That opening, um, they have an, an opening kind of um, sort of explanation, like a crawl, which says what, what's going on. They say, yes, uh, even though we're, we're sending technology out to the stars, nation and ethnic, nation states and ethnicities are still with us. I thought, yep, mm -hmm. and this is even more true 25 years later. So I think there are very good reasons why uh, they're still very important. In terms of the kind of expansion of anime, I've been thinking about that. And because you're, you're right, in the early 90s, it did seem a little bit more quiet. There was the only sort of major anime I can think of is uh, Rama One Half, uh, Takashi Rumiko, based on Takashi Rumiko's manga. Uh, but it really was in the mid 90s that you do have an explosion of, of really interesting things coming along, including Evangelion and uh, Ghost in the Shell, but also 1997, you have Princess Mononoke. Mm -hmm. uh, around that time, you have um, uh, Revolutionary Girl Utena. Uh, you have the real sort of rise of shoujo culture at that point. I mean, Frenchie knows more about that than I do. But um, so this is, it's, 
you know, it, it may just be sort of waves of, of interest and, and talent. And I, I'm actually wondering, and again, French, I was testing this back to you, if maybe the shoujo were so important, because if you think about Evangelion, the shoujo are, are you know, hugely, uh, they're, you know, four fifths of the cast practically, and Ghost in the Shell, um, Kusanagi is, is older, but she's still a shoujo characteristics. So I wonder if that could have been some kind of catalyst. Mm, yeah, well, you know, I think uh, shoujo's were a catalyst for many long years, both manga and American comics had no women in them, right? They were produced by men, they were about men, they were about male topics, and all of a sudden the 24 Nangumi bring in entirely new voices, entirely new ways of making comics, and making anime in a sense. They weren't, I don't think, as involved in the anime making, but I think they influenced the anime directors for sure. I don't know, Stevie, what do you think? Um, well, I think that, I mean, in regards to the area, the relationship between shoujo anime and, and sorry, shoujo manga and anime, I think that that's really an understudied area. I mean, because I think a lot of the views tend to, whenever there's comparisons or engagements, tend to presume this type of shonen uh, anime or shonen manga and then shonen anime view. Um, so thinking about how the shoujo manga world was affecting anime is I think really an important topic to consider. Um, uh, I don't necessarily have any explicit answer because I think it's understudied, uh, me personally, but um, as regards to the mid-1990s expansion of anime, um, I really agree that that era is so important, especially this point of time between like the mid-1990s to the early 2000s, and I think a lot of it really has to do with the um, kind of impact, pun intended, of Eva. Um, and I think there's a few things that really come to the foreground with Eva, which is um, they sponsor or really fund this work through the creation of a production committee, which then becomes this kind of standard in the industry moving forward from there that most works after Eva's success start to work on that model. Um, Eva was broadcast in a light, late night time slot after its initial broadcast and that secondary broadcast was very popular as well. So it kind of sparked this whole new time slot for what is now known as Shinya or late night anime. And then now that's kind of got a particular aesthetic to that time. And then the other element is something that um, a scholar named Maijima Satoshi talks about where there's this period of time after Eva that there's a bunch of anime producers or just creatives who are thinking like, how do we reproduce <laughs> Eva's <laughs> success? So they um, kind of have, according to him, about three different strategies. So one of them would be something like um, making a mature high teen focused or young adult focused work that's very high quality in terms of its animation. So things like Escaflone and Cowboy Bebop. Or the other one was, well, let's just take like this high concept element and run with that. So you have like, as Susan was saying, like revolutionary, revolutionary girl Utena, you have things like Serial Experiments Lane. And then this other group, which is just like, well, let's just repeat Eva. <laughs> so you have works like Gasaraki and Razafon, which are like so similar to Eva, it's really blatant. So there's this type of creativity that I find really interesting, which is not really a creativity of trying to do something new as opposed to trying to figure out how to replicate and repeat Eva. And I think that's that's quite that's quite fascinating, especially that time period. There's this whole explosion of works that come out, um, I think, out of that dynamic. Um, Fantastic. Let's uh, let's move on to the second question then, because I think it sort of it may lead right into this. Um, in the mid 1990s, Japan was understood and still is perhaps as a very patriarchal society. Nevertheless, Shinji enjoys or appears in Eva as a lone male represented in a prepubescent male body surrounded by very powerful young women. And in Ghost, we see Kuzunaki as the presumed female represented in an adult weaponized female, feminine body surrounded by lesser males. So how do these peculiar conditions call out gender and in what way? Um, Stevie, you wanna start that one then? Oh, oh sure. I mean, um, for me, as I kind of mentioned in the, in the talk that 
Eva is really filled with a lot of figurative acting, which is broadly indicative of anime, but um, Eva's cast of characters in particular, it's female characters are really a great example, I think of the, not just complexity that you can create with that type of production of acting, but also the diversity that you can. I mean, each character is so distinctive in their profile. Um, but in terms of, I think, I guess, showing the operations of, of gender dynamics, I think um, as many feminist scholars have, have pointed out, the modern individual is largely seen as a male individual and very problematically just kind of exists. Like, oh, you come into the world and completely ignores the fact that we all come from mothers, that we all literally come from inside somebody else. And uh, this is something that I didn't get a chance to talk about in the presentation, but in that moment where there's this kind of fractal moving in and out of the human body, um, and Shinji comes to his revelation about the fact that others make an impression upon him, there is this moment where they say, the first person that you know is your mother. And so they're kind of bringing that into the discussion. And that's broadly, I think, part of this, for lack of a better word, deconstruction of the male individual that you see. And you know, for Shinji being this very gendered male individual, it's interesting that whenever we go into his head, there's always a female voice. And literally he's voiced also by a female voice actress. So there's this other level, I think, on even just the basic way that he's performed that there's this kind of deconstruction of the male, uh, singular male identity. I apologize for the sound, we had a snowstorm here and those are people like clearing their walks with, <laughs> Uh, I wondered um, about why Kusanagi has appears as female over the years, and um, this has caused a lot of discussion in, in classes I've taught. Uh, does she have to be female? Are we uh, creating a sexualized idea of the cyborg? And certainly, we do see her nude a number of times, and that's especially you know when you think about uh, all the issues involving uh, female nudity and the male gaze. That is, that is something that is a bit of a flashpoint. But I do think, I mean, first of all, and again, I tell my students this over and over again until they're bored stiff, that back in the 1990s, you didn't have any Katniss Everdeen. You didn't have a Wonder Woman movie. I mean, so I'm still kind of come away really impressed that uh, Masamune Shiro, the man who wrote the, the manga, and then um, uh, Oshimamoto, the director, continued, did have this very strong female character. It's not just that she's a strong female character, um, but we see things through her gaze, which in itself is really interesting. Uh, this is a, their point of view is always hers, which is, I think, almost almost revolutionary in itself. Uh, mm -hmm. they, these are, this is a woman who's thinking and feeling and acting and very, very definitely sort of is take, kind of taken for granted that we should be seeing through her eyes. And I, I do also wonder a little bit, Miyazaki is, you know, has a lot of strong female uh, protagonists too. And he always says, it's partly just to be different because there were so many male superhero types, you know, why not have a have a woman, you know, defamiliarize the whole hero concept? And I think that I'm wondering if Oshi may have um, uh, kind of taken that along either consciously or subconsciously in his own creation of, of Kusanagi. Yeah, interesting. Um, so the next question is, both Kusanagi and Shinji experience what both speakers here tonight have suggested is an extreme loneliness of modernist individualism while deeply embedded in a series of families, um, the individual personal family for Shinji and the absolute lack of personal family connections for Kuzunagi, the force group families and their organizational families and both particular birth scenes of, um, of this sort of family offspring with consequences for the future of human family, right? So can we discuss what is actually happening in these paradoxical constructions? Hmm. Right. Susan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I, I, I'll be very quick because I, I really feel like this is really interesting, interesting <laughs> Evangelion. Uh, and really for the, the whole thing with um, uh, the cyborg, and I 
quote in, in, uh, when I wrote about the Ghost in the Shell, Donna Haraway, who's a very important uh, thinker on the subject of the cyborg and who actually appears in an animated cameo in Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence. Uh, and, but her whole point is that the cyborg is someone who is released from the family. That because, as she says, the cyborg didn't come out of the Garden of Eden, it doesn't have any sense of guilt or original sin or dealing with one's parents or all that stuff. And so the cyborg can be one of the most liberated entities around and can also, uh, it can create a, a whole different kind of family, uh, which you know may be what uh, really does happen at the end of Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a really excellent point. And I think... Uh, to an extent, some of, some of that really also applies to Eva. Um, in regards to, I think, the birth, I, I found it, the, these like kind of scenes of birth, I find it really interesting kind of just connecting to my previous answer that the there are two kind of birth scenes in the two endings. So in the TV one, that moment that I was saying, like he kind of, there's this fractal moment and then he has this revelation um, after they're mentioning the relationship to the mother, then he like wakes up in this everyday reality. And as I was saying in the presentation, like that leads to what I'm seeing anyway, is this more interrelated sense of selfhood um, that seems hopeful. But the birth scene at the in the film, in the end of Eva film, um, it's kind of a little bit more obvious, like a literal birth scene. I mean, he s literally splits from his mother, floats to the surface, and it's just his head that comes out of the surface. But, you know, he's ar arrives on this dead earth. And it's such a starking difference to the beginning of the film because, um, you know, there's these scenes of just the, the lush forest when they're trying to sneak up on, on nerve. And then at the end of the film, it's just this barren place. So this type of movement towards, a, a, I guess, an individualism, like maybe perhaps freed from the family, but in the most isolating way. Um, and just to move just to one character that I'd just like to point out is um, the kind of surrogate I don't really want to say mother, but perhaps mother of Misato, who I think really gets left out of a lot of discussions because she's a really complex and very interesting character. I mean, on the one hand, she's very like sloppy and, and carefree, but on the other hand, she's the chief strategist of Nerve and she constantly comes up with these plans. And to bring it into a, a, a an ecological point of view, you know, she doesn't, she kind of over the series and especially in the last film, gets an understanding that there is this larger conspiracy going on, but doesn't quite know all the details of it, but she acts and her, she tries whatever she can with as much information as she knows to do whatever is what she thinks will be able to stop the end of the world. And I feel like there's a kind of ethical element in there that Timothy Morton talks about in particular about in regards to climate change, which he compares to like um, somebody uh, uh, about to get hit by a car or something being about to get hit by a car. There's no like time to do anything but just act. And it seems to me there's a really strong ethics there that she brings to the foreground that I think often gets overlooked. Her character broadly itself gets overlooked. Um, anyway. Yeah, and just speaking to that time frame in, in, in general and its it trajectory in terms of what we were talking about the shoujo, it has to do, I think, more with we were becoming aware of other kinds of genders in the world, right? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just becoming, um, I forget the tennis player who became first, well, went from, um, you know, a biological male to trans female and so forth. And this stuff is just breaking. And it seems to me that in the 90s, the anime directors were really on the forefront of yes. what was happening in terms of, of gender. Really fascinating time, I think, and love the Yeah, movie. I love the moment in Ghost in the Shell where uh, a there's a, a male voice coming out of a, a female body. Yes. And, you know, it's so kind of transgressive for that period. Yeah, You're yeah, like, yeah. What? Still and, is, and even it, though, it, you know, it still is transgressive. That's, I mean, I just looked at both of these again and I was just like, oh, wow. And this was happening in mid nineties. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, I think that's what it is. So um, our final question from this set of question is, both Kuzunagi and Shinji's identities are premised on their wearing of technological skins of armor, specifically for fighting. Yet both experience very different reactions and experiences from these fusions, resulting to some degree in similar positions. Dr. Napier uh, stated in her book, 
Mecca re revolves around the quest to contain the body. Can we discuss Kuznaki and Shinji's containment? Uh, Susan, you can take that one. First. Yeah. Um, I really love the way the Mecca is constructed in Ghost in the Shell. Oshi, in general, is a great Mecca specialist, and he does amazing Mecca uh, of sort of helpful machinery and things. But with, uh, again, with this nude body that then becomes so powerful, which again is interesting. I do keep talking about the nudity because I think there's a sense of vulnerability and fragility that there's it's em emphasized by this, the nudity of the human body. Uh, and then it augments her and gives her so much power, which is not it's really kind of contains her at the same time as it empowers her. It goes a little bit back to this idea of a family, that a family should be able to kind of support you and also give you enough strength. And that's really maybe the her body is kind of like her family too, because as we remember, she, oh, you know, yeah. she's just this this ghost inside this this larger shell. I also was thinking, again, watching the film the other night, about thermal optic camouflage, which we don't talk enough about, I think, in uh, mm -hmm. Ghost in the Shell, uh, because it's so weird. Uh, and I don't really understand except it looks really really cool um but again seriously this makes the body invisible mm -hmm. and yet we have this tour de force sequence in which kusanagi is beating the heck out of this um this guy who turns out to have his memories implanted and it, it's we don't see her we just see what happens the impact of her body and as she kind of goes across this watery expanse and kicking and, and hitting and it's sort of like it really i, I thought actually ghost in the shell is really is doing a lot with different ways of, of augmenting the body including absenting it which is, yeah. and I, I keep going on about how animation can do these things so beautifully. And you don't really, you don't feel the kind of weirdness you would with a live action. You're like, oh yeah, okay. And beautifully realized uh, the, the body uh, there too. So I feel like in you know, much of the film, she is contained even supported by this armored body. But uh, then at the end, she has this choice to go beyond the body. And that is, very exciting. It's not just cyberpunk, it's not just Japanese. I, I say um, there's a book by Arthur Clarke in the 1950s called Childhood's End, a science fiction novel, in which that is we, we do can meld into a larger mind. So what I also like about the movie is it, it kind of privileges the mechanical body and then um, the mechanized body. And then also it says, no, you can make it invisible or you can simply uh, transcend it. Yeah, I think that's true. Sakyo, we can hear you, just so you think we can. Uh, uh, so Stevie, do you want to respond? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a that's a really fascinating point that Susan just brought up. I never really thought about the importance of the thermoptic camouflage. I mean, that it, it's also such a like a defining feature of that world, I guess to say. Like they have that thermoptic camouflage, which is really cool, but a um, yeah, I, I think it actually, it, it, as you said, it, it connects to this dynamic of Ghost in the Shell and how it deals with this kind of bodily versus immaterial mm -hmm. um, dynamic um, and uh, brings up a certain sense of, I guess, questions that I still are relevant in this idea of like, how do we relate to technology, um, especially technology that we may not actually own, like <laughs> even if it becomes part of ourselves, like and what does or doesn't it enable us to do, I think. There's that boat scene where they kind of where she talks about this, right? Like I, I don't own my body. I'm part of Section Nine, for instance. And I think that's one view of technology that Ghost in the Shell has. And then there's another one that Eva has that I think is also relevant today as well, which is this kind of the the obsession with metrics. Like they have these like fake metrics all the time. Like oh, you've been you know whatever percentage for this test that they do. And there's this quantification of the self constantly. And I think that raises the question, like, can you quantify everything about you? And to an extent, they bring that up in one of the episodes. Um, I think it's episode 16, but one of them where they, where Shinji gets like sucked into the angel and then eventually gets sucked into the, the entry plug and it, it dissolved into LCL and they try to like reconstitute him. So like, can we be constituted through this like data goop that makes you up and I think both of those things are with us really today as Susan was saying the way that you know technology is such a like almost addictive part of our lives now that you know we can't live without our cell phones <laughs> you know could you imagine having just a few minutes without your your smartphone and the data that we don't actually own but is about us really kind of dictates so much of our daily lives that 
both approaches, I think, are, are still relevant today. You know, I always thought it was interesting, uh, and I wrote a paper about this thousands of years ago, um, the fact that always these, these, um, these body forms, uh, with the exception of ghost in a way, are, you know, masculine forms which have to have a child in them. They can't have an adult, right? There's no ever in any Mecca I've ever seen any, you know, sort of discussion of why this has to be a child. And yet so many of the Mecca based anime have this child in the machine. And, you know, Kuznaki is also, I mean, we're presuming she's female, but we don't really know. Yeah, that's important. She's, or that we, sh whether she's a child. And that's why I wondered if when she is in the little girl body at the end, if this wasn't some kind of signifier of that, you know, that child in the body, right? So it's just a fascinating, I think this is, I mean, this one we could just definitely do hours on. I'm just wondering if Gundam, oh, yes. yeah. do they have adults? In, boy, it's been a while. I haven't watched the whole uh, series. It, I think it, it goes a lot, but that would be interesting. But I think that's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, the idea that they have to be children and the, even the, in Eva, the English word children is used, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So yep. they're really emphasizing it. In, I mean, in Eva, they make this, I, I believe they're saying like, you have to have been born a certain number of years after that second impact, impact um, yeah. which is not really, I mean, it's a, it's an explanation, but not, not really, not right? Really. <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> like, but why, right? Like, it doesn't really, why is it this number, right? And, I think Gano um, came up with that. It's just like, here, I have to have an explanation. It's because they have to be born after that, right? And, <laughs> and then don't say anything, right? And just let it go because there is no explanation, really. Or people can have fun thinking of explanations for it. Or people can, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. The exactly. joy of, of the Evangelion. Yeah. Well, let's take questions then from the, um, that we got from the registration forms as some people um, registered, they were allowed to write questions. And so uh, these, uh, most of these are com combinations. So from Brooklyn, New York, LA and East Rutherford, New Jersey, um, we are asked on the use of religious imagery in storytelling, can you explain the use of religions such as Shinto or Buddhism in these works and also, is religion actually important in this works, or is it only an aesthetic? Susan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll start with it. Um, <laughs> I am very interested in Oshie's use of Christian imagery, because a lot of times, um, and other people have talked about this, Christian imagery is often used, and we could ask this by Evangelion here in a minute, uh, as a kind of decoration or an exotic sort of cool you know, different sort of thing and otherness to bring in to make the anime somehow more more fascinating. But I think with, with Oshi's own uh, experience of having been in seminary and clearly bringing in Christian imagery early on with this very beautiful and strange movie, Angel's Egg, there is something more going on there. And I think he, and the fact that he does bring in this, this quotation from Corinthians, and I'm still kind of fascinated by the motif of the fall, but I've talked about that already. Mm -hmm. But the other really amazing thing about Ghost in the Shell, and to me, this is very much typical of modern Japanese society, is there definitely overtly Shinto influences, uh, inspirations. I mean, this, this amazing theme song uh, that occurs at the beginning of the movie when she's having her birth scene, and then uh, that, during that, that, scene that I mentioned, she's going down the canal, uh, that whole passage down the canal has this eerie, beautiful music, and with lyrics that absolutely refer to Shinto, um, in particular this, this term amakudarite, coming down from the heaven, but also, as far as I can tell, and I've been looking up uh, more and more about these lyrics, and they're remarkably hard to find out much about them, but I, there certainly are references, I think, to ancient Shinto and the belief in a, uh, in the, the sun goddess, Amaterasu, who's the progenitrix of the um, Japanese nation, and particularly a scene which is probably an allegory of an eclipse, when Amaterasu hides in a cave, and someone, and the, they're, all the other gods are really worried, because what's happened? You know, she's the sun goddess is in the cave. And so they have uh, a young female goddess do a rather um, uh, naughty dance, and uh, at the same time, they position a mirror and um, so Amaterasu kind of peeps out of the cave and say, what is all this raucous fun that people are having? What's going on here? 
and she sees in herself in the mirror. And that, that is there's uh, referred to in the lyrics. And again, I can't help thinking about, it. here we have a Shinto example of looking through a glass darkly. And then we have this very overt Christian reference to Corinthians about looking through a glass darkly. So this um, idea of recognition of, of a doppelganger, uh, of again, who we are vis-a-vis -vis other people, I think is, is really interestingly expressed both in Christian and Shinto imagery. Mm -hmm. And uh, also um, certainly the, uh, the end of the movie when she does seem to be kind of perhaps trans transiting into a new site, I think uh, a new, um, side of consciousness could also be seen as related to Buddhism uh, and the idea that a form of nirvana is when we extinguish the individual self and become part of this gigantic sea of consciousness, this mystical mm -hmm. metaphysical sea. So uh, th there really is a pleasure in looking at, at how Oshi weaves different religious currents into this mm -hmm. already complicated movie, and, but in a way that is actually very uh, quite moving and I think um, really just works very effectively. Steve? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think you know that that's a, a very fascinating take. I, I, I'm not sure I can really top that regarding Eva, and, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'm, I'm not too knowledgeable about thinking on these, uh, uh, about the, the religious references, but what I do find really interesting about them is that um, the approach to taking or looking at different different references broadly in a text as dense as, as Eva is a really good example of how we kind of carve out different areas to examine and interpret a text. So um, uh, I, I have a, a friend and colleague who uh, in Japan who was telling me something interesting that uh, he, he found it fascinating that there are some Japanese otaku communities that would spend a lot of time looking at Eva's references, but focusing almost exclusively on the science fiction references. So for instance, the Human Instrumentality Project is actually a reference to a 1970s novel by the same name. There's lots of references to 2001 Space Odyssey. And then you have um, many US and European fans will look at um, the Christian references and you know think about how we can interpret the work through that. And then there's also the other way that you could look at it, because a lot of them are actually Kabbalic references from Jewish mysticism, like Lilith, for instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Tree of Life. I mean, we even have ancient Hebrew there. So I think there's all sorts of ways to go and, you know, like examine this particular work, but how to go beyond that uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of providing an interpretation, I'm, 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 I, I'm, I unfortunately <laughs> fall short, I think, of knowing that those details. But I think it's really, um, a great example of how we can all kind of attack the same text, but from different perspectives. Yeah, so so um, Ghost uses it as a part of the, uh, the, you know, the force of the story, and Ava uses it for aesthetic, right? I mean, a lot of the times that crosses appear, it's just an aesthetic, it doesn't Well, they're just, they're literally explosions, they're right? Literally so explosions. like, oh, here's a cross. Yeah, exactly. Except for, I think, Lilith, who is on a cross, which is, right. you know, mixing like, this yeah. Christian and Kabbalic mysticism together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ava, uh, forever a mystery. Um, so we have from Brooklyn, New York, Ghost in the Shell seems to be a questioning of the definition of the human, according to certain characteristics like consciousness, whereas Evangelion seems to be more a questioning of the fate that each person experiences even, even willingly. Are these, the, are these the elements that connect both anime and which explains why religion seems to be so important in both anime? Mm. Hmm. hmm. I'm not sure about connection, because to me, again, that sort of makes them quite different. I think one thing that that really uh, fascinated me about Ghost in the Shell, and then even more so in Ghost in the Shell 2, Innocence, which I have to give a shout out to, because it is an extraordinary movie. It is so visually compelling. It just, mm. <laughs> you'll never see anything like it. And it's a really pretty good story too. But uh, Innocence, uh, the second Ghost in the Shell really, expands some of the ideas in Ghost in the Shell about humanity. And in Ghost in the Shell, it's still fairly 
uh, kind of undercurrent, but there is a sense of, again, back to the cyborg, the cyborg is not human. Maybe it has a ghost, but does that mean that it's more uh, connected with humans or can it have other connections as well with another mm -hmm. kind of consciousness? And that that's very, very brief glimpse of the, the basset hound on the bridge that is looking down at her and she's sort of connecting with that. That is partly because, oh, she loves basset hounds and insists on having a basset hound in every movie. But uh, this sort of basset hound idea is expanded in Ghost in the Shell 2 to include dolls, uh, more basset hound. Mm -hmm. um, I think even, um, gosh, was there one other? There may have just sort of something organic too. But uh, the idea is that you can, it's not even just about organic life. It's all different kinds of life, which to go back to that uh, question about uh, religion is very Shinto-esque. The idea that we are part of a huge network of, of entities and we are connected to each other and it's not necessarily a dualism, a, a binary opposition, but that we are, um, we are, human beings are not above the animals or above rocks and stones, but we're all part of that. And I think uh, that is something that, that Oshi is really exploring. In, in his work that we, you know, the human, he's kind of problematizing the human or certainly the human as the, the main focus of the world, which is kind of interesting when I think of the end of Evangelion, which is terribly, I mean, human, you know, all those people kind of gathered around above the coral reefs you say, but there's something about, you know, you could almost look at it as this sort of mingling of, of human beings kind of giving each other community, human solidarity. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's that that you you really hit the nail on the head with this with specifically in in the Ghost in the Shells dynamics of like uh, I guess like a respect for the non-human organic as well as technological, yes. um, and I think broadly that's that's also something I I think that to an extent comes out in in Eva as well. But between the two, there's, there's these questions of the idea of agency of what acts and what acts on on us. Um, and um, you know how how those things affect us. I, I, I this is a bit of a weird uh, segue, but I, I, it kind of reminds me of something that um, uh, uh, um, uh, that Jane Bennett talks about when she talks about this idea of vibrant matter, and she brings up this. I guess idea that really always stuck with me about eating about food like there's this common saying like you are what you eat and it's one of the common examples of where we kind of accept that the outside things that are non-human actually deeply affect us because it literally becomes us in a way and i think you know it, it seems far from far flung from both eva and ghost in the shell but this idea that um that you know technology is itself both somehow outside of us but also part of us it does act upon us and there is, I think, um, as you stated, this kind of broader spiritual element involved there that uh, you know we we could really do with some more reverence to in terms of things like, for example, what we eat, where it comes from, the world that we engage with that has, I think, ecological connotations as well as understanding the type of technologies that we have in our daily lives and their actual effects, detrimental as well as potentially liberating uh, on us. Yeah. Good. The next question is from Jakarta, Indonesia, Ithaca, New York, and Sparta, New Jersey. That's like going across the board there. Um, and it's kind of a three-parter. Um, first, what is the significance of Evangelion having multiple endings and iterations? That's a huge question, I think. Uh, do you think the reboots of Evangelion or Ghost in the Shell still maintain a sense of identity crisis? And finally, how has their thematic relevance changed from their initial time of publication or production until today? Um, are they more, re more relevant, less relevant, or relevant in different ways? I'll let Stevie, Stevie oh, okay. you take that one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you uh, get the bad one, right? <laughs> truthfully, I, I think I have like mixed feelings regarding this. I guess it's not just these reboots, but broadly this kind of incessant need to reboot and remake and re-update everything. I mean, I think on the one hand, it's really, there's some positives, like for example, it's like fun to see the characters again or explore that world in more detail. Um, and you can also make corrections to various areas, perhaps adjust problematic elements from the originals, re-update, re-improve. But then on the other hand, you just have this kind of 
speed of everything constantly being re-updated, constantly being remade, constantly re reproduced, that nothing really stays and we kind of lose the fact that anything has some kind of, there are enduring effects in the world because if something is rebooted or remade and redone, then suddenly it might invalidate what came before. So you can't really say anything about anything at any moment because it's just kind of happening so quickly. Um, but as for the new versions, just to really get to it, I don't know if I really see the same type of identity crises in the first ones as I do in the reboot, specifically for the Eva. And I think part of what made the first series as well as films so interesting was this tension between the different performances of animation, between a lot of embodied acting as well as figurative acting. But to give an example, in the new ones, I think it's very much leaning on the side of figurative acting, which isn't necessarily bad. But like to give one example in this scene that I described, episode 19, where the Eva is kind of crawling on all fours, if you look at the scene in the new movies, uh, the Eva doesn't do that, it shoots off its arm. And that's really not, I wouldn't really call it figurative acting, but it is a direct reference to the 1970s super robot atomic punch kind of dynamic. So there's a difference there that I think there's not so much tension between the two. Um, I have some other thoughts on thinking about how um, uh, the different reboots can be reinterpreted from an ecological perspective, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. So perhaps uh, uh, Susan can jump in and if we have time, I can return to it. Um... I have not seen much of Ghost in the, uh, the Shell standalone series. What I saw was quite different from what um, from what I love about the original. Uh, there's a lot of good action and some you know very interesting plotting, but um, yeah, I missed the sort of philosophical meditation. But that but then I only saw a few. Maybe it got more so as the series continued. Um, uh, the sequel or the next movie that Oshi did, as I mentioned, Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence, takes up a lot of the questions from Ghost in the Shell and takes them in a slightly different direction. You're, it's not quite what you're expecting. And as I say, it's it's very, uh, there's some really shocking scenes, some really extraordinary scenes, but it is really trying to take you even more into a more metaphysical direction. And I, I like that, but that, that's very different from what Stevie is talking about. This is not a reboot. This is, yeah, is yeah. really a, a continued exploration. Um, I really don't want to talk too much about the Ghost in the Shell live action movie. Uh, except just to say what really interested me about watching the film the second time the other night was how the one of the most useful things that this film could do would be to provide a basis for thinking about what Japanese audiences want versus American audiences. Because certainly Ghost in the Shell 2, um, sorry, Ghost in the Shell live action, to answer the question, is very much about an identity crisis in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, because, well, <laughs> Kusanagi is a very different creation in Ghost in the Shell, uh, and, uh, the live action version. In fact, she has very little relation to the original one. Uh, so what's going on there? And the ending, it's very, very different. And the ending provides lots of closure. And uh, the original ending provides much less closure. So I think that, you know, we're talking about what would be good for anime studies. I think one thing would be very easy would be uh, international audiences and looking at what what happens when um, anime is kind of taken across borders and what kind of changes are made, uh, both the media borders from, from um, animation to live action, but also simply from a culture like Japan's to a culture of America. So that's to me what would be most interesting about this, that movie. Yeah, I'd have to say the only thing I liked about Standalone Complex were the Tachikoma. Yes. The <laughs> well, they're, they're always horrible. charming. Yeah. Um, so our final question of this um, series is from Queens, New York, from Quezon City, uh, Philippines, is both anime series are some of the most discussed anime texts. In your view, what kind of new approaches might still be done and apart from these two franchises, what other franchises or settings have you explored in terms of the theme of identity crisis? And finally, what are some suggestions for new directions in anime studies? Uh, Susan, you want to start that one? Well, I mean, there's so much there and we've already mentioned some of that. I do think anime audiences is a very fruitful topic. I know that, um, Frenchie is working on the shoujo, which I think is, even though it's a well-known topic, is actually still really under 
understudied and it's so fascinating we've talked a little bit about how important shoujo be, uh, were as sort of impetuses and inspirations for all kinds of, of movements in anime so those that would be two things that i would think about um i also sometimes wonder about you know geopolitical events and i'm really pleased what steve was talking about for um the ecological aspects of some really important anime and um as for my own research on identity crises, the one that, sorry if I can plug my book for a minute, but the um, thing about my Miyazaki book in which uh, Kiki is all about an identity crisis and it's a really beautiful one. So I'll stop there. Okay, um, so now uh, Sakuya is going to return with some of the questions from the Zoom chat. Um, so will I see those in the chat line or? Hi, I'm back. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so we have received a lot of questions. Thank you so much for your interest, everyone. So I hope most of the questions from the live chat is already answered in the discussion. So now I would like to pick some questions from the live chat, which haven't discussed yet. And as we have a lot of good questions here, I'd like to extend time a little bit. So the first question is, um, like you, um, Susan mentioned, like about our live action. But I like, do you believe the live action has the same capacity as anime to bring these stories or themes to life? I love this question, but the only trouble is I could go on and on. And on. <laughs> My students will tell you how I go on and on and on about this. I, I just say animation is a whole different medium from live action, and it allows and offers something very, very different. Not necessarily better, but for those of us who are used to live action, animation can be incredibly liberating. And I think, again, I've mentioned this a little bit in my talk, it, because it's so, it kind of reaches into the, it's the animator's mind, he's kind of he or she or they are, are working down into their, their dreams, their consciousness, their, their imagery, it can create a whole different sort of, of uh, imagery, uh, narrative, characters, uh, met things like metamorphosis become really important in animation because you can do that. And so I'm not saying that the live action can't do these things. I mean, I mentioned Blade Runner, which is a fabulous example of a, of a noir, cyberpunk uh, problematization of what it is to be human. Uh, but I am saying that, that animation can give a kind of fresh much more, uh, in a way, very, very creative way of, of dealing with this. TV? It, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I think they both live action and, and animation have very different capacities for being able to express. So um, I, you know, I, I, in to avoid reiterating a lot of what Susan said, I think, uh, and then able to get uh, uh, further questions going on from the audience, I think we should uh, leave it there. I think that was very well said. Okay, um, so next question is, what advice or guidance does Ghost in a Shell and Eva offers us for dealing with the tension between individuality and environment involved with being a self, especially in the, in, especially in the face of environmental catastrophe? Mm -hmm. uh, CV? Yeah, I guess I'll take this one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think part of it is really thinking about reimagining what it means to be a self and specifically the borders of that self um, and where that goes, what we allow, as I was kind of alluding to in some of the question answers today, as well as a little bit in the presentation, that, um, you know, what we allow to affect us or what we can accept will affect us. Uh, and also to think about it, not just in terms of this uh, completely positive worldview of like, oh, everything is open, but also to understand that there can be detrimental effects. And um, from there, then we can start to think about, um, I guess, a certain ethics that we all would have of what we find acceptable, um, but also moving forward to think about how, what ways can we not necessarily um, exclusively as individuals, but as large groups as, you know, in terms of, you know, as large of a scale as we can even think of can start to affect change towards, um, you know, lessening the catastrophe that is already underway. 
Um, so uh, uh, I, I think you know the performance of selfhood and the way that we conceive of that performance is, I think, a first step towards that those ends. I think also that the that particularly this period of, uh, in the mid '90s and the cyberpunk uh, narrative all are suggestive of a dystopian future right because of the mechanism i think of blade runner with you know piece junk cars everywhere and so forth but what was redemptive about cyberpunk was that they almost always found something to build upon to create new neo tokyo and so forth uh, was that there was always just a hint of redemption there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Blade Runner uh, 2049, which I think is brilliant, um, it does it in post Anthropocene where there's it's a yeah. it's a burnt earth. There's nothing left. There is no humans left, right? And yet there is this kind of um, spark, this beginning with this new kind of human being that is the daughter of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this. I, mean, I don't want to give too much away, but. Um, it, it, in a sense, presents at the end the new human being, the new kind of slash cyber human being, right? Um, and I think that that's what's so interesting what that, and I think anime does this better than films because it has so much command of the physical uh, yeah. viewpoint, right? What you can offer in terms of transformative views of settings and locations and weather and stuff like that. Basically, agree with what everyone said. I, I might mention that Ghost in the Shell 2 also takes this sort of dystopian world and gives you some sense of, of a different kind of community, which is again not mm -hmm. only human, but links in with, with other with animals and other kinds of entities, and a sense that yes, there could be there can be solidarity. It may not be exactly what we're used to when we think of community and solidarity, but but it can be it can be, can be there and, and be helpful. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you so much. And that's all for tonight. Um, sorry, I'm sorry that we couldn't answer all of your questions. Um, if you're interested in watching original Ghost in the Shell film, I found that you can now watch it for free on YouTube video from the link below. I put it, I put the link. For Evangelion, the release date of the latest movie, which is supposed to be the grand finale of the entire series, was just announced four days ago. And it will be released on January 2021 in Japan. So you can watch the OSHA trailer from the link below as well, like the latest one. So, and I would like to give a big thank you to our special guest speakers, Dr. Napier, Dr. Swan, and Dr. Alani for sharing their expertise. And for those watching at home, thank you so much for joining our second session of this series. We hope to see you again soon at the next session on November 19th. In the next session, we will analyze the power of music in anime. Three musicologists will unravel meanings hidden in anime music, such as My Neighbor Totoro, Grave of the Fireflies, Cowboy Bebop, and Your Name. Um, so finally, before you go, uh, please fill out a quick survey in the description as well. Please tell us what topics you are interested in for a future episode. And your feedback will be very, very helpful for us. So thank you again for joining us today. Please continue to stay safe, and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.